How many times do we read scripture in Mass? You used to get this question wrong all the time. Three, right? First reading, second reading, gospel. That's three. But actually it's four. We read scripture four times because we have the psalm, the part that we sing. Sometimes I forget that because I'm too busy wondering whether it's going to be bless the Lord, oh my God, or bless the Lord, my God, before the cantor raises her arm in the air. But we read the Psalms in Scripture. Every single Mass, Scripture is proclaimed through the Psalms. So we thought it was important that we focus on the Psalms. Now the Psalms are generally attributed to David, and there's usually context given. Psalm 63's context line says, A Psalm of David in the wilderness. Out, hiding in the wilderness. And we'll get to why in a second. But if you're not familiar with David's life, he has some ups and downs. He did some good things, like taking Goliath out with a pebble. But he also had some rough spots, like Saul, the king that he killed Goliath for, tried to have him killed out of jealousy, hence hiding in the wilderness. He also unified Israel and brought in a great kingdom, found the ark, and he also had a loyal servant, Uriah, killed out of lust for his wife. The sheer humanity of David and these songs of praise and anguish and turmoil make the psalm so relatable to the human heart. And every single page of scripture we can pray in a listening sense, but it's the psalms that we can truly pray in a way where we take the words of scripture and make them our own, we make them our prayer. And the idea that God inspired these words that he somehow dual authored these words with David, assures us that God still desires our heart, whether we are going through joy or sadness, whether we are triumphant or in anguish. And so we have these Psalms to turn to. And in turning to Psalm 63, we see in the opening lines that there is a restlessness there. When I experience restlessness, I want to silence it with things. Just one episode of Daredevil. Just, just one glass of wine. Just, just some finite, fleeting thing. And those things aren't bad. They can be good. They can satisfy. They can be enjoyable. They have their time and their place. But they will never quench the thirst that the psalm describes as being a parched land. And it's the fruit of the Spirit's self-control that helps us to control those appetites, to get those in check. The times in my life where I did not have the fruit of self-control, it was like I was drinking salt water. I would just drink and drink and be thirstier and thirstier because I was trying to take this deep desire for God and quench it with something so fleeting. And that restlessness, the desire for God, that is the fruit of peace. It is the peace that we desire, the peace that St. Paul describes as uh, surpassing all understanding. We desire that peace deeply. And David claims that he finds it when he looks upon God in the sanctuary. Now, what's a video series without a little bit of original word context? Sanctuary in this passage doesn't have to mean a sanctuary space, like a part of a church. Sanctuary in this passage it comes from the word Kodesh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it, it means in his holiness, in God's set-apartness. In this we see what C.S. Lewis alludes to, where he says that we're hungry so we know there's food. We're thirsty so we know there's something to drink. There's a part of us that longs for something beyond this world. And that's the peace we find in God, and we know it exists because of God's sanctuary, God's set-apartness, God's holiness. So we find this peace, and this peace that comes from God's kindness. And we see that laid out in the psalm as well, where David describes uh, being brought underneath God's wings. And it's a peace that keeps him awake at night. He describes being awake through the night watches, reflecting on God's kindness. And kindness is a tough one for us. How do we distinguish between kindness and goodness and generosity? But 
kindness is is when that goodness has a face. Kindness is when uh, our generosity and our goodness meet. Kindness to a Christian is like good bedside manner to a doctor. It's that extra touch that protects the human person, that respects their dignity. Kindness is something that we only learn from God. God teaches us how to be kind, and we in turn are kind to others. One last analogy, because I love them. As I read this psalm, I was reminded of when I was in college, in my my fitter days when I would rock climb. And I was reminded of how I would, my first time or two up the wall, I'd climb quickly, but I wouldn't be smart about it. I'd use too much strength on easy holds, and I'd eventually start to wear myself out. I would get exhausted and scatterbrained, and I would get worried, and I'd start to vice grip really easy holds and waste my strength. And as my peace started to fail, eventually I would fall off the wall because I had no self-control as I was climbing. But I'd be caught by the kindness of rope would let me hang, find my peace again, reestablish my self-control, and from there I could get back on the wall and I could accomplish the goal that I set out for. And then I could come back down the wall and offer that same kindness to my buddy who was belaying for me. And we are called through the psalm, through our life, through discipleship, to have self-control so that in saying no to ourselves, we can find that peace and kindness of God shared with others. years ago uh, I was with some girlfriends on a retreat and we were talking about the latest in Christian music and we were discussing this song called Kind by Amanda Cook. The refrain goes something like this, you are kind, you are kind, you are kind, you are kind. God is kind, great, we get it. But looking back on it, we really do not. And it's in those conversations in those months that follow that we're really reflecting on this idea of God's kindness and why is it that we struggle with that? You know, we've talked earlier about how kindness is the action of generosity and love, and God is the perfection of generosity, love, kindness, and mercy. Father Michael Gately, in his book, uh, 33 Days to Merciful Love, says it really well. He says, what is the gospel? Again, it's the good news of God's mercy for sinners. The good news that God doesn't love us because we're so good, but because he is so good. That he loves us not because we deserve it, but because we desperately need it. We desperately need God's love, goodness, kindness, and mercy. But here's the question. If we know that it is so readily and freely available to us, why aren't we asking for it? Is it because we're afraid? You know, if you listen to the song, Kind, and you go and you look at the very first lyric, it says, you are not a tyrant king. And that image just draws me right back into Genesis in the garden with Eve and the serpent. And often we think of the serpent as this tiny little snake, when in reality, it's a large dragon, a Leviathan. And the first thing he says to her is, did God really say not to eat the fruit? You won't really die. God knows that if you eat this fruit, you will become like other gods. And it's in that moment that he poses this question to Eve by placing doubt in her heart. And the question is this, is God a tyrant? Is he someone who we can trust? Or is God father? Is he faithful? Is he generous? Is he kind? Is he goodness? Is he love?
So throughout salvation history, God has proven time and time again that he is a father and not a tyrant. Over and over, we have failed. We've fallen into sin, we've turned our backs to God. And how does he deal with us? With pouring out love, mercy, kindness, goodness, peace, forgiveness. See, God is faithful even when we're not. And that should give us the greatest sense of peace. Have you ever wondered though why your life isn't full of peace? Is it maybe because you're spending a lot of time chasing after things of this world, worrying about what's my future gonna look like, my job, how are things going with my family, my friends, my relationships? Problem is, is when we take our eyes off God, fear and worry and anxiety enter into the picture. But when have those things, worrying about those things ever given us a sense of peace? See, fear is the worry that God won't get it right. And we don't fix that with courage. What fixes fear is our trust and faith in God. Trust in knowing that we are infinitely loved. When life gets going and crazy all around me, the number one place I turn to recenter myself, to seek peace, is the Eucharist. Whether that's attending Mass or encountering Jesus face to face in adoration. Jesus tells us in the Gospels when he first encounters his disciples after the resurrection, he says, Peace be with you, not as the world gives it, but as I give it to you. Coming to Mass, coming to pray before the Blessed Sacrament, even if I don't necessarily feel God's presence, I always have peace in my heart. This is the kind of peace that we long for. And Jesus knows that this is the kind of peace that we were made for. Besides encountering Jesus in the Eucharist, the source and summit of our peace, what are some other practical ways that we can encounter Jesus' peace? This is where the fruit of self-control comes into play. I like to view this fruit through the lens of the virtue temperance. The Catechism tells us that temperance is the virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasures and provides balance in the use of created goods. Sirach reminds us in the Old Testament, do not let your passions be your guide, but keep your desires in check. So temperance helps us to keep the right things first, like prayer, almsgiving, and fasting, which God uses as a means to make himself first over the material things in our life and to fill those holes that we have in giving up money, giving up food, giving up our time, he fills those things with himself. Temperance helps us to give priority to the right things. Let's take prayer for example. I was at a conference once and a speaker was talking about how he was struggling to be consistent in his prayer life. He found that morning was the best time of prayer for him. So what he did was in the evening, he would place his Bible on a chair and he put the chair in front of the door. This meant that in order to leave his house in the morning, he had to physically pick up God and move God off to the side. Do we really think about our prayer life like that? This story completely changed my life. Before I pick up a remote to watch TV, before I pick up a book to read for pleasure, I always ask myself, have I taken time to give God his due today? Have I spent time talking to him, listening to him? This is where the fruit of self-control helps us by helping to better order how we spend our time. Let's be honest, the number one excuse for not praying is, I'm too busy. But I would argue that this is probably the greatest lie that we tell ourselves. I heard at once the word busy means being under Satan's yoke. When we say that we're too busy to pray, this is what, God, this is what the devil does. If the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Self-control, temperance, helps us to, to keep in moderation things of this world and things that are of God. In the Catechism, it goes on to say that temperance is meant to help us live well, which is none other than to love God with all one's heart, with all one's soul, and with all one's mind, which Will talked about in our very first week of breaking out the fruits. God has modeled for us what it means to be kind, putting the action of goodness and love into practice. He reminds us that he wants to fill us with his own peace 
And we can do that through the fruit of self-control by giving God his proper due through prayer, almsgiving, and fasting. Take some time to reflect this week on where God has been kind to you and to whom you need to extend kindness. Think about peace. Where are you not seeing that in your life? Where do you want God to fill himself? Think about self-control. In what areas are you lacking control? What areas are you too afraid to give that control over to God to allow him to fill it with peace? Be reminded that we are praying for you and we hope that this week will be a fruitful experience of kindness, peace, and self-control. We've been talking and we're going to continue to talk about how we can make our earth more like God's heaven. We're going to continue to pray about that as a parish this year. Jesus has sent us on a mission to make our earth more like God's heaven. And that's going to require us to leave our comfort zones. This is not a mission that we're going to be able to carry out from the comfort of our homes and our sofas. And it's a mission that's going to be really hard. We have a long way to go. I don't need to explain to you how our earth is not like God's heaven yet. So how are we going to know if we're getting there? How do we know if we're making our earth even just a little bit more like God's heaven? Jesus tells us throughout the Gospels that we'll know the tree by the fruit that it bears. Every year since we've been dating, my fiance and I, we've gone apple picking at an orchard outside of Columbus. It's a huge orchard. You wind up actually driving from like grove to grove and tree to tree to pick the apples. This year we were there. Uh, and we have become very efficient at this, going there for so many years. And we were looking for some Granny Smith apples to finish it up. So I'm looking at the map, I'm looking down, Elizabeth's walking ahead of me, and she says, here it is. I don't have really any ground to stand on to tell her that my interpretation of the map, this is we're about four rows back and two rows too far to the left, because looking right at us are Granny Smith apples. The easiest way to tell that we found the Granny Smith apples is to look at the fruit on the tree. It's not to look at the ribbons, it's not to look for signage, it's not to look for the map. It's to look at the fruit that the tree bears. And the same thing is true for ourselves in our life. Look at the fruit our life is bearing. Is it the fruit of the Holy Spirit that we've been talking about? If it's that fruit, then we need to keep on the hard work that we're doing to see that fruit be born. And if it's not, we're going to have to make some changes. We're going to have to have some hard conversations with ourselves and with others. The Holy Spirit has come to us in our baptism, and for many of us it's been deepened because we've been confirmed. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Are we letting the Holy Spirit bear its fruit, or are we getting in the way? Evaluate with your small group. Is this an endeavor that's going to help make earth more like heaven? Or while it was a positive experience, you're not feeling called to continue, and that's okay. You don't even have to know necessarily what you're going to do next. Just decide whether or not this is something to continue. And if most people decide that this is something to continue and you're not feeling called in that direction, that's okay. Don't feel pressured to stick around with something that you're not seeing the fruit from in your life. The most important thing from a practical standpoint that you can do is if you decide to continue, go ahead right now and set the next time, date, and place to be together. You don't have to know what you're doing yet. You don't have to decide that before you all leave, but decide where you're going to be and when you're going to be together again. With your small group, remember that Jesus is calling to do us to do this mission together, that this mission requires community and requires the larger church. So we're looking forward to seeing us together again as a whole community. Know too that Spencer, Krista, and I are continuing to be here for you and your small group. So if you feel stuck, you feel like you don't know what to do, reach out to us and we'll help you out with some ideas. We've hoped that these five weeks have brought you closer to the community and have given you an opportunity to explore these fruits of the Spirit. that we decide that we're not rolling bloopers. <laughs> <laughs>